Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are going to talk about one main, main topic with three different specialists handling them. So this is a symposium because we are addressing one issue, but from three different perspectives, the same issue. And this issue is the uh, influence of migration on religion, the impact of migration on religion. And we have three eminent people here who are going to speak to us this afternoon about this. And the first speaker is going to look at it from the Christianity point of view or perspective. The second person will look at Islam perspective of this issue. And the third person is going to look at African traditional religion perspective. So I will start off with the first speaker of today. And I have told them that they will address it, each topic, each uh, perspective rather, about 20 minutes. So that the three of them will be spending one hour in addressing these issues, in this issue. So 20, 20 minutes after which, we are now going to have our questions directed to each speaker. So I believe that 10, 10 minutes to direct questions to them. So in about one and a half hours, which is about 90 minutes, we are likely to be done. Praying that uh, we'll be able to handle the internet issue for that short period and issue. So please, now I'm going to call on the very first speaker, Doc, Doc, Reverend Father Dr. Michael, Enyinya Okonkwo, who is the head of the department of religious study in National Open University of Nigeria. He will be taking us on the, the, uh, the Reverend Father is a senior lecturer of this university. He will be taking us on the Christian perspective. Father, you have 20 minutes and you have the right to share your screen because you are a co-host. So you can go ahead and share your screen. And this uh, PowerPoint has been posted to our WhatsApp group so that uh, people can follow. Thank you. So you are welcome. PowerPoint. Yes, we are seeing it now. So it is exactly three minutes after 12. You address it for about 20 minutes. Yeah. Good afternoon, my senior colleague, my fellow colleague. Um, we may not go into much protocol of the of here and the other professors. But today we are looking at the impact of migration on religion. I am taking I am looking at it from a Christian theological perspective. And the word of theological is very, very important in this discussion. It's not just on a religious perspective, but on a theological perspective. Um, I want to, in the first place, I want to present this question because there's no missionary religion that is not in the past of from experience migration, movement from one to the other. And we find out that Christianity as a religion is a migrant religion. It is a religion that is always on the move, going from one place to the other. And this has a lot of implications. Yes. Now, experience it's also so reveals to us and in all reality, we find out that religion and migration, especially the missionary religion, they are so interconnected. Now, we move straight to the point as a way of introduction. I want to look at, within my introduction, the following point. One, migration as a general phenomenon. Then migration and the other two are seen probably computative uh, perspective concept that is immigration and uh, immigration. Then we look at some of the characteristics of migration and we look at the push and pull factor 
of migration, then the challenges to the problem of migration, then we pose some questions. First of all, migration as a general phenomenon, we say it is something that is always in consistent change. Look at it from the uh, demographic perspective, economic, political, social, and also the religion. It changes their landscape. So it is not something that is static. And that's why you find out that the meaning will continue to change. But the basic thing is that migration is about human mobility, about aliens, about strangers in a foreign land. And functionally, we can say that migration implies change of residence. Something also very important about migration is that it is something reversible in the sense that you can migrate to a place there is also the tendency of coming back. And in that case, we see that migration, even migration within itself, is not something that is static. I present these few pictures to give us a clue what migration can be. These are people moving. And if you look at the first two here, you see that they are moving in opposite direction. And we see them, and there are many other means that assist this migration, just as the second one we tell us, the people, and also, if you look at this very well, you find out that there is also some challenges. You see people falling into the sea. You see other people struggling. And sometimes they reach themselves, like people blocking the railway. So these are just a symbolic aspect of forced migration. It is not just an easy going thing you find a lot of experiences coming up from it. Having said that, we have already mentioned when we talk about immigration, immigration means when you are leaving point A, that is coming from. So you are immigrating, for example, somebody leaving his own country. That's where the concept of immigration comes in. And immigration is where you are going to, where you are landed. I've already talked about the irreversibility that's going back to the original place where you started. So some of the characteristics of migration, one is increasing plurality and diversity. And it involves persons, language, creed, living habits, culture, identity, and ethnicity. Then also the attendant problem and challenges associated with this. You talk of multi-directional movement, border crossing, and sometimes this border crossing can even give rise to harsh immigration and deportation laws, experience of discrimination, exclusion in the job market, violence, victimization. What we are just trying to say in some ways that migration is not just an easy going thing. You encounter a lot of shocks, a lot of uh, uh, surprises. Then we look at what we call the push and pull factors of migration. What are the possible things that can, whether you are pushing or pulling, it is not if you are exerting a kind of energy. Then we look at something like war, continuing war and conflict, hunger, quest for survival, discrimination, denial of opportunity. And if we bring this closer in our present situation here in Nigeria, we see many people, there was a lot of lamentation of the brains of this country moving outside the country. It's a form of migration, either for quest for survival, for a better life, or there could be some real or perceived persecution or lack of freedom, maybe freedom to do what they want to do. So we look at, when you look at this, it can lead to xenophobic attitude. You see the picture here, when you look at this picture, this is just a sign to a migrant, the way he's being treated. You see, certain people also in the course of this migration, maybe for one experience or the other, they will be demonized as maybe that these people, they are bad. And we see it with our Nigerian identity, especially when you are the once you are a Nigerian, suspicion is already going off. Who knows what he or she is coming up with? 
Then what is a little bit painful about this whole thing is that the lack of political will by the government in order to reduce this problem associated with migration. And sometimes the churches are not even free. We sometimes give it a tacit approval. So having said that, we present some basic questions. And these questions are, one, has migration any impact on religion? How is migration perceived and ought to be perceived? This how it is and ought to be is very important for us. And how do churches explain theologically some of the perceptions about migration? How do the migrants themselves take their faith as a people in exile in the context of sociocultural and religious diversity? Based on this, we build on two pieces. One of these is that no missionary religion today that is without a history of migration. Secondly, that a migratory act marks a pivotal moment in the history of Christianity. Then we also see that migration is one of the key factors that has contributed immensely to the geographical expansion of Christianity, the rediscovery of Christian identity, the self-understanding of Christian unity and its diversity, and the internal diversity of religion, not just Christianity across the globe. Now, we also find out that migration has a reciprocal relationship to Christianity, if not other religions. From there, a little conclusion is being drawn, though, yeah, and we know that religion fosters migration, and migration aids in the expansion of religious franchise and its self-understanding. Now, there are some complexity of terms when we talk about this Christianity, and which gave me some little concern, because when we talk about Christianity, the first question that may be asked is, the first question that we are, what form of Christianity are we talking about? Because we know we have different uh, forms of Christianity, okay, call it denomination. So we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about Christianity. Um, that is what we, so what we do in order to remain in this topic, we, we come into a, a web of this reductionism, trying to reduce, to bring out what we may say, no matter the difference, there are certain basic things that pull them together that they under that umbrella Christianity. Then, and this commonality, which I call it of Christianity, will include the Trinitarian confession of God, the strategic rule of Jesus Christ, the centrality of the Bible, and the consciousness of continual renewal within the Christian fold. And by implication, every Christian church believes that the church and members of the church are strangers in the world. And the book or the Great Commission, which migration also is, and what is this? To go and proclaim the gospel to all creation and also make disciples of one nation. You cannot make it without migration. So we already see the relationship between migration and Christianity. Having said that, um, I would like us also to take note that Christianity is a missionary religion and has been a very big beneficiary of migration. And secondly, for you to do the work of God, that is, you need both the divine and human agency. Therefore, the survival of Christianity today is thanks to migration. Now, we look at Another point of view, because I'm talking from theological point of view, the theology of migration. It becomes another complexity. It is not about the theology, it's not about, it's not theology about migration or human mobility. And what it goes beyond that, it is a reflection using the history of migration. And when we talk about this, we are talking about the experiences of the migrants 
guarded by the teachings of the Bible, here comes in, and the magisterium. And when we look at the magisterium, we are talking about the hierarchical, the contemporary theologians, their views, and also the experience, the concrete experience of the migrants. You cannot separate it when we are talking about this. So it is a theological practice of reading the signs of the time in the light of the gospel. That is all about this theology. And it assures the migrants of full membership in the church. Because when we do this theology, it's a way of restoring hope to the migrants and also to speak for and with the migrants in the wider society. Not just to defend their rights, but the, to join them to talk about this right, because they must be part and parcel of it. And to do this theology, there are certain basic preconditions. You talk about empathy, coming to the situation of that to feel with the migrants. And you have to be very objective since here, because at times we see even Christianity has been calling. Um, most of the problems that we also encounter in this migration. So we must also tell ourselves as Christians, we are not getting it right yet. Then we also must be uh, conscious of the fact that God is in a, in a very platonic sense, that what is here is transcendent. And the movement as Christians is going to what is real, which is beyond this world. Now, we talk about the peculiarities of this theology of migration. One, it tells us in a plain way that the church is a stranger. The church is in exile in this world. And if we understand it as, that everything we are doing is struggling to go back to our home. Now, and it poses the idea of home and being away put them in a just a position and of a homeland and a foreign land. Maybe if we have time, we may come back to this idea of homeland. And who is that homeland and where is this? It is God. And he is the true home that everyone desires. Now, we look at the place of migrant in the theology of yeah. migration. We have uh, about uh, two minutes to round up. Ah. Okay, uh, we have the place of the migrants. We see that all of us here, we are aliens. The migrants, therefore, we must welcome each other. And also, we see the idea that everyone is, and also that if that is the case, we have the ultimate goal, see ourselves as a migrant to ensure that everybody comes to um, the idea of welcoming, working with the migrants, encouraging them, because what we do for them, we also do it for ourselves. So that there is no difference between the migrants and the so-called natives. And that is the basic teaching of the church regarding this. Um, for want of time, we may not go um, into details as well. In the first place, we see that the influence of migration on religion, it helps religion to transcend its help, religion to understand itself, to encourage its theological development. And also through migration, new methods have been developed in evangelization, which is also what migration is helping religion to, religion to do. And also through migration, religion of Christianity has already discovered itself. And that is to this idea of theology of migration. And um, I think there are many other things that we can start just giving the summary of what migration from the Christian perspective we are all strangers, we are all migrants. So the idea of my treating migrants just denying our faith as Christians. Thank you very much. Thank you Hello. very much for that beautiful presentation. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, yeah, uh, Dr. Okorokwa, for this your presentation.
uh, we would have wanted you to continue, but uh, others have to speak so that we can uh, finish here. I am sorry that I have to stop you and uh, you wait up to the time. It's uh, 22 minutes after, and um, he has been able to tell us that migration has impact on religion because it is migration that makes religion to go around the world and that migrants should be accepted everywhere because we are all migrants here on earth. So, and so many other things. There's no um, I'm not to call on uh, the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Kamal Sarumi, who is going to talk about the impact of migration on Islam. And Dr. Sarumi is the head of unit of Arabic studies in uh, the uh, department. He is an associate professor. Dr. Sarumi, you now have the virtual space and you have 20 minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Yes, we yeah, can hear you. You have the you. right to share your screen. You can share your screen because you are a co-host. Yes, we can't we can't see your screen being shared, Dr. Sarkin. Okay. You just go to share. You are allowed um, to share. Ah. Oh. Hello. Can we you hear me? You. We are hearing yes, you. we are hearing you. I'm trying to share, and this uh, the internet is telling me something is preventing us from sharing this. I don't know. Wow. Distinguished uh, professors. Okay, thank you. On, on the other side, Director CCE MGS. Good afternoon, and senior colleagues, and every other one in the house. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The topic of my presentation is uh, the impact of migration on religion, and I'm going to present the Islamic perspective of migration. Now. Migration as a concept from an Islamic perspective. The word or the transliteration okay, of the Arabic word yeah. in an Arabic language is Hijra. I was saying that uh, the Arabic word for migration is Hijra. You know, and this is derived from Hijri, which means to depart. It is also used for the meaning of to shift, to abandon. That is abandonment. But generally speaking, it means to give up one's own land or to migrate from one place to another, mostly for the sake of religion. And various interpretations have been advanced from different Islamic scholars, and this has given multiplicity of meaning. But I'm going to adopt the interpretation of a, one scholar by name Inayatullah Subhani, when he's giving, he was giving his own perspective, he said, migration is leaving home and place for the sake of God and settling in another place. And in Arabic, this is called Hijra. And this particular word has even been in Islam even before the arrival of Prophet Muhammad. And this particular word Hijra, which translates in English to migration, came into prominence from the Hijra embarked upon by Prophet Muhammad and his followers from Mecca to the city of Medina in the year 622 AD. But before they embarked on migration to Medina, there had been previously migration by the followers of Prophet Muhammad to Abyssinia in Ethiopia, which falls in Africa. They sought asylum with King Negus, but that migration is taken to be a figurative migration. And uh, in Islam, the new abode is called Darul Hijra, that is 
the abode of migration, domicile of migration, house of migration, or Darul Salam, house of peace, house of belief. And the former abode is called Darul Kufu, that is house of war or house of belief. Now, I try to plot the trajectory of migration prior to the time of Prophet Muhammad in 622 CE. And I went back to the time of Prophet Adam and Hawa. Prophet Adam and Hawa migrated from paradise in heaven onto the heart, onto the surface of the heart. And also, later, later, some thousands of years later, Prophet Nuh from I mean, migrated from Mesopotamia in southern Iraq to Mount Ararat, not Mount Arafat in Saudi Arabia, Mount Ararat. This is in Eastern Turkey, bordering the country of Iran. And then also Prophet Ibrahim later migrated from a city called Ur in Iraq. He migrated to Babylon, from Babylon to Haran, and then to Damascus, to Canaan, to Palestine, to Egypt, to Egypt in Saudi Arabia which happened to be the ultimate site of Ibrahim's migration. And later, Prophet Musa also migrated from Egypt to Canaan and then to Palestine. Then came Jesus Christ, Isa, and then he spent most of his life in uh, Palestine. And then he migrated, eventually migrated. You can see that I put a very big question mark from his place of migration to, the, to his site of migration, the other place, paradise. And then later, Prophet Muhammad came, and then himself and his followers, they migrated from Mecca to Medina. Now, let us try to, to examine the kinds of uh, migration that we have. We have corporate migration, <coughs> migration. That is migration from one place to another, like the case of uh, the National Open University of Nigeria, when we migrated from, Lagos, from people who are making noise in the background. Please, I can see that the noise is coming from our guest speaker. Prof, sir, kindly mute yourself, Professor Shishima, because I cannot remove you. You are our speaker for today. Please kindly mute yourself, sir. Yes, unmute, Dr. Sarumi. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Hello. Sir, thank you. Yes, I can hear you now. I was talking about the kinds of uh, migration that we have. I said we have corporeal migration, which is physical migration. That is, you know, bodily migration from one place to another. Like the case of now, when now migrated from Lagos to Abuja. And then we also have mental or spiritual, emotional, psychological migration. And this is a thing of the mind. This is abstract migration. But it is observed that the latter, that is, spiritual migration or mental migration often precedes, it determines and leads to the former. That is, it leads to corporeal or bodily migration. That is, before the body can move from one particular locus to another locus, the mind or a mental process or a psychological process must have on, and been taken within the human body, within the human mind. And then from here, I proceeded to look at another kind of migration, which is religious migration or secular migration, which we shall discuss later. And this, talking about the spiritual, it is, for example, say, migration from disbelief to the status of belief, or from being indifferent about a particular religion now to now being a believer. That is spiritual. And then for the second one, which is physical, I said from Lagos to Abuja, from Abuja to UK to USA or Canada. Another kind of migration is voluntary migration. And then we have also forced migration. I've taken the place or a board of migration external to the human body. It can be external to the human, it can happen within the human body, which is a thing of the mind. And then migration in the Quran, I have to say this, if you hear me or see some uh, quotes from the Quran on the screen, they are meant for pure academic exercise. It is not a tactical means or way 
of sermonizing anyone. Now, the Muslims during the prophet's time migrated to Abyssinia and Medina. Ab Ethiopia, that's Abyssinia. The movement to Ethiopia was temporary and that is why it is not mentioned in the Quran. And then the later migration that occurred from Medina to, no, from Mecca to Medina is regarded as permanent migration. And that is why it has been mentioned in the Quran. This is real migration. But in any case, both of the Hijra from Mecca to Abyssinia in Ethiopia and migration from uh, Mecca to Medina, both were forced migrations. And then in the Quran, we have this verse that you can see on your screen. And those who emigrated for the cause of God, after they have been wrong, we will surely settle down in this world in a good place. But the reward of the hereafter is greater. If only they could know. That is, those who physically migrated, that is corporal migration, physical migration. And in this particular verse, we can begin to see the impact of, of migration on the Muslim faithful. And now, in another Quranic verse, we have this, the ones who have believed. Now, the word believed has been bolded because what took place here is spiritual migration. They believed first before they now emigrated physically, before they now embarked on corporal migration. So in this particular verse now, we can see both spiritual and corporal migration. And these people have faith in, in the cause of God with their words and their lives are greater in rank in the sight of God. And it is those who are the attainers of success. Their Lord give them good tidings of mercy from him and approval and of guarding for them wherein it is enduring pleasure. They will be abiding therein forever. Indeed, God has within a great reward. And this is another particular verse from the Quran. And from here, I try to look at the tradition of Prophet Muhammad. What did Prophet Muhammad say about migration? Prophet Muhammad said, who is a real migrant? Who is a true migrant? And he answered the question himself by saying that the real migrant is one who migrates from that which God forbids. From that which God forbids, that is a real migrant is one who has undergone a spiritual migration that later now leads to physical migration from wrongdoing, from wickedness to righteousness. And then the impact of migration on religion of Islam. Now, before I begin to take these points one by one, I want to say that migration almost always affects religion. This is so because when people migrate to a new place, they alter routines of their daily life and new experience inevitably acts upon even the most tenaciously held religious tradition. Conversely, religion also often inspires migration. And then personal and private pursuit of holiness has also inspired innumerable pilgrims to visit shrines that are usually located where their religion originated or had its earliest efflorescence. A contrary flow of holy men beyond the frontiers of the society of the above has often led to the conversion of strangers, even across linguistic and cultural barriers. But in general, we may therefore say that religiously inspired migration, whether peaceable or warlike, have a great deal to do with definition of civilizational and cultural frontiers in historic time. Now, if we look at the pilgrimage that is always embarked upon annually by Muslims, it's a friend and help to homogenize religious and secular culture within each civilization. It became especially important for Islam. But long after the caliphate collapsed in Turkey in 1924, thousands of pilgrims who travel to Mecca each year from all over the Muslim world maintained a loose but effective unity among the community of the faithful. Holy war and peace able conversion on the other hand, enhance heterogeneity by bringing new populations 
within the circle of one or another religion from time to time. That's about religious migration. And then there can be secular motives to emigrate from one place to another. But when migration is undertaken for secular motives, for other than religious reasons, also, it also had overall effect on spreading civilized complexity. Its immediate impact on religion was usually to provoke some sort of blending of old and new traditions as immigrants encountered new peoples and new conditions of life along with alien faiths and religious practices. But religious interactions exhibited many variations depending on conditions of the encounters and on choices individual leaders and teachers made in coping with unprecedented novelties. Now, in matters of religion, however, conquerors, those who entered other countries to, to, to conquer them, and then their captives alike, they have three options when arriving in lands whose skills are superior to their own. The newcomers may accept the established religion of the land to which they have come, retaining only a few telltale traces of their own older practices. And this is exactly what the Turks did when they came in contact of Islam, either as slaves or as conquerors. So they eventually, yeah. So migration under, under secular motives can be taken for economic or political reasons, but this carry a people to lands less developed than those they left behind. So in this case, migration it has less impact on their tr traditional religious practices. Now, part of the impacts of, uh, some of the impacts of migration on religion can be on the individual, can be on, on, on that nation of, uh, of those who are practicing the religion. And that's why I say as number one, the impact can be on the individual Muslim, it can be on the generality of Muslim faithful, it can be for the entire Muslim world, and then on the generality of human society. In this case, we have the spread of Islamic religion to other regions of the world, like Abyssinia first, and then to other parts of the world, like Persia, Iraq, North Africa, West Africa, and Nigeria. It also has impact on the civilization of the world, and then proselytization, that is evangelization, preaching. With this, converts or reverts again into the fold of Islam. Also, they can also lose converts into other faiths and then spread of religious education, Islamic in this case. And then Hello, doctor, you have uh, two minutes more. Okay, okay. I'll try to round up now. Now, the impacts can, on religion can be negative and then they can be positive. But we should remember that migration of Muhammad and his followers to either Ethiopia or later to Medina was an escapist strategy for the Muslim Ummah. Thus, when they got to their new place of abode, it meant better life for them, safer, secure settlement at the new abode to practice their religion peacefully. Then uh, they were safe and secure from the troubles and persecutions and oppressions of unbelievers of Mecca. The Muslim nation was founded and Islamic government established when they got to Medina. And so, uh, justice began to be administered on the Muslim nation. And then consideration of migration as struggle in the cause of God. It is an act of worship of God. Then spiritual development. Spiritual development, here I mean one in whose mind spiritual migration has taken place. Such one has migrated from wickedness to righteousness. So this is going to bring spiritual development to the individual and also spiritual development on that particular society. And then in Islam, migration from Mecca to Medina at that time was confirmation of belief. And then it served as a means of strengthening the, the unity and cooperation among Muslims. And today, pilgrimage serves this purpose. And now the Muslims were able to organize and establish the first real Muslim community with social, political, and economic independence. And life in Medina allowed the Muslim community to mature and to strengthen, and the people develop an entire society based on Islamic principles. 
And then the necessity of assisting and supporting the migrants with basic necessities of life. When they got to Medina, those who helped them to stay are called the helpers who gave them asylum. They gave the migrants food, they gave them shelter, they gave them clothing. Some of them even shared from his wives to the new uh, immigrants. And then part of the impact on the Islamic religion is the Islamic almanac calendar start from this remarkable event in the history of Islam. It counts years in Hijri as in Alexandria, Coptic calendar or the Gregorian calendar. Emergence of the lunar calendar as option that replaced the solar calendar in the Islamic world. Then general societal reform. General societal reform, that is spiritual migration from disbelief to belief, from wickedness to righteousness, then earning of God's blessing and mercy, forgiveness of the sins of the past. This is a major impact. One who migrates from wickedness to righteousness, we have it in the Quran, we have it in the Hadith that all his sins of the past will be, will be forgiven. And then success here and in the hereafter. And now the negative aspect of the impacts is condemnation of those who refuse to embark on migration from house of disbelief to house of belief that time. And then condemnation of those steep in corrupt practices and their refusal to migrate to a house of peace to righteous character. Denial of some fundamental rights to those who refuse to migrate from Mecca to Medina. Decay and degeneration of society for so, those people or for such individuals who refuse to migrate from wickedness to righteousness. Recommendation of various categories of punishment depending on the degree of the sin from which migration has been jettisoned. And then non-identification with and refusal to entrust non-migrant Muslim with affairs of the Muslim migrant. And then uh, we see the obligation, migration. How many minutes more? One minute, two minutes? A round off, sir. A round off, sir. Okay, okay. No, I, before, I round off, before I go to my conclusion, I just want us to see the alchemy of migration in Islam. That is yeah, yeah. the high point, the high point of migration in Islam. We have it that whoever emigrates for the cause of God will find on the heart alternative locations yeah. and abundance. And whoever leaves his home as an immigrant to God and his messenger, and then that overtakes him, his reward has already become incumbent upon, upon God. And God is ever forgiving and merciful. So my concluding remark is that in the world at large, as populations increase and migratory movement expand to new proportions and places, religious intermingling and interaction are sure to intensify. And thus, religions are impacted positively or negatively, depends. So, Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doctor. Um, on behalf of the director who is uh, experiencing a network challenge, um, I would like to, on behalf okay. of the uh, director Dr. Gloria Neto, is experiencing network uh, challenge where she is right now. Um, I would like to take over pending when uh, uh, the network is restored. I'm sorry, let me off this. Uh... Um, thank you, Doctor, for this wonderful presentation you made right now. We really appreciate you for this uh, wonderful presentation. We want to go ahead with the last speaker, who is a professor, who is Professor Sawan Daniel Shishima. Professor Sawan Daniel Shishima is a professor of African traditional religion at Benue State University. So, Prof, you have the floor now to do your presentation. Yeah, uh, rural urban migration is a worldwide phenomenon. People and races migrate from rural to urban centers based around them. Human beings are dynamic, and therefore, migration has become part of human existence. This is because people keep changing their place for various reasons. 
Another area of interest under this study is this uh, rural urban migration. The paper and religion. Uh, we now go to basic terms. One is migration. Uh, migration is the movement of people from one geographical location to another based on could this could be temporary or permanent. Excuse me, Prof. Can you share your screen? Uh, the, the host will enable the screen. Uh, um, the host can help me enable the screen sharing. So um, we are on term, definition of terms. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, no, Prof. We can hear you, sir. Yes, so I'm trying to, yes, I'm trying to define terms. So the first one is we have defined is migration, the movement of people from one geographical location to another. Uh, it's, this could be temporary or on permanent basis. A rural urban migration is migration that which is done internally, not internationally. That is what is known as rural urban migration. Say, for instance, somebody migrates from Makwadi to Abuja. That one is rural urban migration. Now, African religion is the religion of the Africans. It was founded by the Africans and transmitted by a word of mouth. Out generation of migration. This migration affects African religion either positively or negatively in different ways. Yeah, migration has a lot of impact on African religion. Some of the areas are one, religious impact. The Africans are notoriously religious and they carry their religion anywhere they go. So the slaves imported in North America, for instance, for to work on plantations, carried the African religion there. Some Africans take on different strands of African religion in new land or a different form of African religion. This can be caused in criticism. This is why the Africans who entered the Caribbean and Haiti did. They started practicing voodooism. Voodoo is a religion which is partly African religion and partly North African religion. So voodoo means lesser deities. It's, the concept is from a way in Dahomey Island, and it stands for gods and spirits of Africa who make up the Haitian nation of culture. The cultural impacts has a lot to do with migration. As you know, African religion cannot be separated from culture. So it has affected the word in different forms, in terms of language, folklore, music, songs, dances, traditional medicine, charms, witchcraft, and so on. Uh, when we talk about language, throughout the Caribbean, languages spoken today are literally thousands of African words that have been retained. The unofficial language of the Caribbean is Creole. This is a product of meeting of Africa and Europe. Uh, in Jamaica, Ireland, you hear names like Kuji, Kwaku, Kofi, Kami. These are names of African people of Ghana. They have affected these places either negatively or positively. We talk about folklore. You have a similar thing. Africa positively, area law, especially in North and South America. For instance, there is a proverb it is the supreme being who pounds for food. And another which African religion has impacted, I mean, migration has impacted 
positively on African religion is traditional African medicine. Uh, traditional medicine is cheap, relatively accessible. All this affects the migration, either positively or negatively. There are also now the other factors of rural urban migration are push and pull factors. And the push factors are political factors, employment opportunities, natural disasters, war, shortage of food. And the pull factors include hope for a better way of life, job creation, in, improved living conditions, education, better housing, medical care, and so on. Other factors are bad and oppressive laws, heavy taxation, unattractive climates, and so on and so forth. Then the consequences of rural urban migration, it reduces population pressure on agricultural land at the source region. It also reduces projection, population pressure on the fields at the rural areas. It's a uh, shortage due to lack of manpower in the villages or places where people migrate. It leads to economic and social problems in the source areas. Some of the problems are um, commercial sex, prostitution, theft, and so on. It also leads to the development of social amenities at the urban centers. Again, it boosts markets at the receiving regions. For a high level of interconnectedness, uh, positive impact. Other positive impacts include traditional medicine, as we have said, which tries to heal the body and spirit and solves the problem of e lock protection from the unforeseen circumstances, securing jobs and other issues. Now that uh, we are talking about insecurity in Nigeria, it protects people from insecurity. Uh, during war times, because some practice religion and Christianity and Islam. Also, there is uh, intermarriages between Christians and Muslims in places, in the new places which people live and settle. There is distortion of cultural fabrics of Africans by the cosmopolitan nature of urban centers, a hybrid of cultures, Western and African. There is condemnation of witchcraft, which is African wisdom. And the negative aspects include neo witchcraft. Neo witchcraft is the practice of witchcraft in the urban centers. We call it neo witchcraft because a new wave of witchcraft practice. And this is practiced in the form of denial of people's promotions, uh, hiding of people's files, square pegging in round holes, rape, killing, failing of student exams and all that. We want to conclude by saying that rural urban migration is carried out by many human beings and it is also important to their thoughts. And those who have been submerged by the expansion of cities makes it difficult for them to discard their religion and culture. One can aptly say that rural urban migration has both positive and negative impact on African religion. It has tried to erode the very foundation through which African life stands on. This is descend from the way of life of most Africans who live in towns. Even when they finally return back to the villages, their lifestyle do not agree with that of the home people. Thank you for listening. Hello? Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. I said thank you once again, Professor Kawan Daniel Shishima for this wonderful presentation. Though the network didn't allow us to enjoy most part of your presentation, all the same, we appreciate you, sir. Mm -hmm. Now is the time for participants to ask their questions their comments. Uh, I have one person who have uh, indicated 
make comments and ask questions. So if you are interested in asking questions, you can indicate, you can write us so that we'll give you the opportunity to ask your questions. We have um, Professor Hakim Daniel indicated first to make his comments and the presentation. Professor, you can go ahead and make it. Thank you very much and uh, good morning from my neck of the hood. I would like to commend all the presenters for having the audacity to take upon this important uh, aspect of migration. Um, <clears throat> but I'll start with the last, uh, the last presenter. Uh, quite informative, but I think is rather too general. And uh, a lot will have been done or concentrated on specificity in such a very wide African traditional religion. Why am I saying this? You, you started off by telling us the general thing that, uh, general knowledge about migration and then you talk about rural urban migration, you know, within the context of Nigeria, which is understandable. Then you went into the uh, Atlantic, so to speak, and uh, that, that is where I believe you should have concentrated uh, because historicizing, contextualizing, in fact, conceptualizing and contextualizing the Quilombo in what is today Brazil, will have really bring out that issue and the role of African traditional religion in the diaspora that you, you know, mentioned briefly. Because wherever Africans you know, found themselves, there will always be that triadic relationship. That what Pierre Esther called the double consciousness to recreate self, the issue of their faith being reinvented. And I think you probably want to look into that. When you mentioned voodoo, I have a question mark in my note. Who's voodoo? Who call it voodoo? Perhaps you could have also shed more light on this and then look at the Eurocentric versus Afrocentric perspective or debate about the African uh, 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 religion. Uh, having said that, let me move on to Dr. Sarumi. Uh, his paper is also very interesting, quite informative, learning moment. But let's look at the pre idra era, pre idra era, when you, you make reference to the fact that it was a figurative migration. Of course, thereafter, you said it was never even mentioned in the Quran. Then you begin to ask the question and you can give us some clarification in your paper proper, because that is, that is part of the vacuum you need to fill as a scholar. Your presentation is not going to be just general, even specific as you try to, but it must also critique existing knowledge so that you can contribute to knowledge. And uh, what am I trying to, 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 to say in this context also, is the, the debate between the Arabo-centric Islamic scholars and the Africanist scholar. So you need to bring out that. Why the denier of the African, of Africa rather, and Africans in the context of Muslim or Islamic migration that you eloquently presented. What is spiritual migration? I think you should tell us a little bit more. The beef in your paper or your presentation rather is slide seven and eight where you, you, you unfortunately apologize and there was no need for the apology because it's an academic environment as Professor Abdallah mentioned you know, earlier, but it's also an academic paper. It is not 
and it should be. I don't know whether you are trying to make or all of you are trying to do an advocacy uh, presentation, as in the case of the first presenter, Father Dr. Funko, and I'll come to his paper. But seven and eight, your slide that I saw uh, is actually uh, the beef, and you're supposed to add more on that because that is where your contribution is, in my opinion. Uh, so give us some more Quranic uh, backing since you are talking about um, uh, a Muslim or Islamic migration. Last but not the least is uh, the first presenter, uh, Father Dr. Konkwo. And uh, he, you, you also repeatedly, I see your paper uh, with some, some sense of responsibility as an advocacy paper. Uh, one, I did not see any biblical test, no contextualization, no critique of scholarly works. Uh, but I have the following questions. What is the role of Christian leaders? That alone could be your paper. It could be a paper. You have so many papers within your presentation. Perhaps you can shed more light. The roles of Christian leaders, bishop, pastors, ministers. What exactly is theology migration? For what? For whom? And where? What is missionary religion? Because you, 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 you mentioned that in your first, your opening statement, missionary religion. Lastly, the push and pull factor is more of a general knowledge. And I was wondering whether you can shed more light by contextualizing it with some specificity of Christianity as depicted in the Holy Book Bible. For the three of you, can you shed light on faith? When you migrate, whether from that rural to urban that uh, the prof you know, uh, explained, or from Mecca to Medina, or even to the denier of the Abyssinia and the African context, or for this missionary religion, uh, what is the role of faith? What becomes of faith? Is it the same thing that you know, occurred in the 16th century with the Africans forced across the Atlantic, ended up in Brazil, um, you know, creating a whole community of the Quilombo? Or is it the same thing as Oyotuji, as we have in North Carolina, or part of what is today United States? So we need to know what is the role of faith? What becomes of faith? Faith as a Muslim, faith as a Christian, faith as a uh, African traditionalist. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We have learned again today. Thank you very much, Professor Tijani, for the wonderful contribution. We appreciate you, sir. Um, I can see two more hands raised. Um, before I go to uh, Michael I will. Um, I don't know if it is Dr. Musba or Yebode or Pro. Thank you, I'm Dr. Yebode Musba. Okay. Thank you, Musba Yebode. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to appreciate the three presenters. And I just want to make some contributions. And I think one vital area which they have not touched has to do with uh, religious syncretism. Because of migration, today, we cannot see any pure Islam. We cannot see any pure Christianity. We cannot see any pure traditional religion. As people move to different locations or different countries, they move with their religion to the extent that even today in Saudi Arabia, you cannot talk of pure Islamic religion. Because of migrants from other religions, they have gone there to kind of, in quote, pollute or water than the original sense of religion as was presented in the scripture. And if you look at Christianity too, you see a lot of uh, Islamic practices going into Christianity because of people who have migrated to certain area. 
worse still, if you look at African traditional religion, you will see that you cannot see pure African setting of religious practice without bringing in Islam and Christian ideas or uh, practices as you may want to call them. But in terms of uh, the rituals, the belief system, the mode of worship, et cetera, like that. So it's migration, migration that has caused this religious syncretism. And uh, today, you have some people even mooting the idea of a uh, Christian or Trado uh, Christian. You know, people who tend to be combining the three together and uh, giving uh, a kind of similitude of a religion of its own. So thank you. That is my contribution. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, I can see another hand, Mrs. Blessing Alabi. You can you have the floor now to ask your question. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sirs and mas. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. This goes to three of our presenters. My question is specifically for the Reverend Father Sir. I wanted to ask that what efforts you know, do the migrants make to adjust to their new environment, you know, especially the, the Christian migrants? I'm aware that um, a lot of missionaries, you know, move from one country to the other or one state to the other. You know, you, you didn't really mention what they face, what are their specific experiences, were they accepted? You also talked of in time, the different denominations, you know, in Christianity. Yes, they exist. You know, for example, I just moved from Lagos to Abuja because of work. And I was looking for my own denomination, you know, here at Abuja to attend and feel comfortable with. But depending when my denomination opens their own center, I decided to attend another one so that I can continue to be blessed, you know, and not stay on my own. That's just a typical example of what people face when they enter new environments. Do so these people come post back to them and say, no, because you're not if they cut me or from living faith, we will not accept you in a church because you do not cover your hair and we close hair. So, sir, please, I want you to buttress on this. What are the experiences you know people face when they get to new environments? Are they accepted? Are they forced to comply to the rules in those churches or in those different denominations? Do they lose their salvation? Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, for your question. Uh, I can see our uh, Ebo, former Vice Chancellor. Sir, you have the floor to make your contribution and ask your question, sir. I'm very sorry, but I was the first person to even ask to, to talk uh, when the uh, NATO was, was there. I would like to congratulate all the participants. Unfortunately, I did not attend the uh, traditional religion uh, part because I was in the mosque. But I remember as a vice chancellor, I was one of those who insisted that there should be a department of traditional religious studies rather than just Islamic or Christianity. We need to, to, to engage, we need to convert. Uh, and I can see the grand old man is uh, smiling uh, as usual. Uh, mine is, is a, a question, or, but rather an observation on, on two of them, on Islam and the Christianity. Let me start with Islam. If, if somebody converts, from Christianity to Islam is that a migration? Because you talk about layers of migration, figurative, or psychological, and so on. So do we have psychological migration? Somebody is a Muslim, he becomes a Christian, or somebody is a Christian and he becomes a, a, a Muslim. Is, is, is that considered as a migration? And secondly, I, I think it will have been very interesting. Uh, of course, in the pool paper, you, you probably could do that. When you look at migration, jihad and migration, in Nigeria, you know, down for you, you had the Pulani migration and how that in fact on Islam and migration. I, I, I didn't see any reference to, to, to that, maybe I missed it, but uh, it's very, very critical to analyze the jihad movement in, of 1804 on the template of, of uh, migration. And if you migrate in Islam because of prosecution, what happens when the prosecution stops? Are you still a migrant or do you still continue migration? Uh, and then you, you very interestingly, you, you talk about all the prophets and how they migrated. 
including Jesus. Uh, and then you said he migrated from uh, is it, uh, 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 Palestine. And I'm not sure where he migrated to. I thought we're all aware of where he migrated to. On the third day, he migrated to heaven. But there was a lot of question mark there. Does that mean that there are other sources of indi indication where he might have migrated to beside heaven? Uh, and then for my Christian brother, I, I, do, do you see evangelism as migration or as a call to, 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 to in the services of the Lord? Uh, because, because a migrant has an economic, psychological, and a whole bunch of other things. But a, a missionary may not have all those other baggages that will force him to migrate. So it's evangelization, migration, and then the going back to Islam also. In, in about 1380, that, uh, about 40 migrants from Mali who were evangelists brought Islam to Kano. So, but then they stayed and they integrated with the entire community and they stopped the proselytizing, they stopped the, the, uh, the evangelism. So at what point does a, a missionary evangelist stop being an, a, a, a migrant? Thank you very much. Grand old man, well done all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, moderator, I'm through. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof, for your consistency and uh, wonderful. So, uh, I'm online with the director because uh, she confirmed that all the networks in where she is is uh, currently unavailable. Uh, she would like to make a small contribution to the phone speaker. So I will give her the space to uh, do her contribution so that uh, before we we'll, we'll go to Professor Sogolo for his contribution. Ma, you can go ahead and do your contribution. Okay. I want to apologize for this big embarrassment. I have never seen this. I never knew there's anywhere like Nigeria that this network is not safe. I've been on it since. Try to connect and it should be showing connecting and see if you want to do it. Thank you, thank you, Ma, for for that words of encouragement. We appreciate you, Ma. Um, thank you so much for thank you. Thank you, Ma. Yes, uh, come, Professor Tugolo now. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to greet uh, former Vice Chancellor uh, Professor. Each time I see him on these, uh, uh, you know, lectures, I always feel very uh, happy. It makes things uh, good, and he's a scholar. You know, I, I appreciate that. But uh, he's getting old. That's the that's the problem. <laughs> now, the I want to congratulate all the presenters. The, the you know, exciting. Um, a very, very good presentations. I have a few questions. Uh, the first one is on uh, the migration in Islam. Where uh, true migration is defined as movement from uh, wickedness to uh, uh, righteousness. That's what he calls mental uh, migration. I, I really do not fully understand that. Well, is it within 
Islam or, or do you, can that be non-religious? In other words, can you have true migration if you cease to believe in Islam and yet you do good? Is that good? Can good be separable from the belief itself? That's the point that wasn't too clear. I, I thought that there would have been some you know, clarification about that, whether you can get a non-religious good or good is always tied to Islam. That's the point. And I think if I had asked this question, I would have wanted the former VC to really answer it. I'm sorry to say this because I know it, it will throw some light on it. So if you have time, please ask him to speak on this, whether good can be separated from you know, uh, uh, religion. That is that way. The one on African uh, uh, religion and migration, again, I find that very uh, exciting. It's a good uh, paper, but then for me, it was, you know, the, the two aspects to that uh, presentation, you have, you know, talk about migration, and then you have talk about African religion. But this see the blend. You see, I, I thought that uh, the presenter was going to talk something about African religion, the way it is practiced in Brazil, or African religion, the way it is practiced, practiced in the Caribbean. So that you can see, you know, so some effect of migration on African religion. But then I found that each time he was talking about migration, he defined migration quite all right. He talked about migration in a general term, but then he went on now and moved to African religion and also talked good about African religion. Makes sense there. But I didn't see the blend. He didn't bring them together. So the topic of African uh, migration and African religion didn't quite come together, but it's something that he can still do. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. Uh, much so, so, wonderful so, contribution. Uh, before uh, I'll give uh, the floor to Dr. Nena. Let me ask uh, Dr. Michael. Sir, uh, do you want to make a? Do you want to ask question or you want to? Uh, you will be the last to respond. Mm, I want to. I want to ask question. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. Um, the question goes to the last presenter. Um, in his presentation, he mentioned that um, we cannot separate African traditional religion from religion uh, from African culture. Um, I think that is an area that um, scholars in African traditional religion has to do some work because it has a lot of implication. If African religion is identical or is so close to African culture by implication, it means that everybody who is either a Muslim or a Christian in Africa definitely is also a practitioner of African traditional religion. I think this is an area probably uh, one has to be a little bit careful the way we look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, doctor. Um, Dr. Nena, you can take the space now. Okay, thank you, moderator. My, uh, I'm happy to see our former vice chancellor here. Good afternoon, sir, and uh, Professor Shogulu, whom I always uh, like to listen to. Good afternoon, sir. My question borders on, I don't want to say that I am, I am a Christian because I am born a Christian. And I know that some, there are some other persons who are of other religion because they were born into that religion. Now, my question goes to the three presenters. And that is, is there anything apart from our indoctrinated belief system, our belief system that shows that there is one 
who supraordinates the affairs of man, in quotes, God. Morally, I am a Christian and I'm moral, I think I'm morally upright, but I want to see, or I want them to say physically what shows that someone supraordinates the affairs of man. I mean, tangibles that you can see. Thank you. I know it's, it's not, but, but it's something sometimes I think outside the box. And I now said, what if I'm born a Muslim? I would have been a Muslim. And what if I'm born in a, uh, an African? I would have been that. So what is it that makes us think this way? Is there anything that shows physically, apart from the belief system, that there is one who supported the affairs of man. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, in absence of uh, other questions, I would like to call upon the presenters, the speakers, to respond in the following order. Uh, Professor Shishima will, will start the response section followed by Dr. Kaha Sarumi. And the last but not the least will be Reverend Dr. Okorongo. Professor Shishima. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I want to thank, hello? Hello? We can hear you, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay, fine. So I want to thank all the people who have contributed to the paper because asking questions is part of the paper. The first uh, comment, Prof, uh, the paper was too general. Actually, in the in the the. Hello, Prof. Are you there? Hello, sir. Hello, Prof. This one is a net on now. The oh. thing has connected after one hour. Welcome back, ma. Um, I can hear you very well. Thank you. I thought you people have left. Can you hear me is now? Can you hear me now? Can yes, me now? we can hear you, Prof. I'm frustrated. Okay, fine. <laughs> <clears throat> so I say in the main I'm paper. Was... I'm hearing, please. Okay, fine. Ah, so I say in the no. main paper, I have discussed some of these things in detail. Even the issue of Buddhism, I have discussed it in detail. But you know, in terms of presentation, you have a time frame. So we have to dance according to that time frame. Now, then the, secondly, the place of faith in migration. I think yeah, somebody asked a question about faith. Usually in African religion, people, Africans carry their religion. But you say the African man is notoriously religious. So he carries his religion anywhere he's going, in the plant, in the, in the in where he's going to sit, where he's going for a party, in school, in parliament, and everywhere. So they have faith in their religion and they carry it anywhere they go. And the, the, I think Dr. Oyebode asked about syncretism. I, asked, I also wrote about syncretism, and I even mentioned it when I was discussing. I, when I was talking about Buddhism, Buddhism is not strictly African religion. It's a combination of African religion. Religion and other religions. So it jettisoned their religion completely, or sometimes they combine uh, African religion with Christianity and sometimes Islam. That is what part of what I have also discussed in the paper. Um, then um, uh, Professor Adamu Fuma VC, well, he just made a contribution that he has tried to introduce the Department of African Traditional Religion. This is a welcome development. You can bring me on board. I will come and uh, 
begin the department for two years, and then before I come back to my base. And then Professor Sugulu made insightful comments. Well, the trust on my paper is on the impact of migration on African religion. It's not on the practice of African religion in the diaspora. What you, you have said should be somebody who is presenting on the practice of African religion in the diaspora. And Dr. Mike uh, discussed about African culture and well, this has always been a contention to distinguish between African religion and African culture. But you see, the Africans, we believe that any person who is an African, even though he is Christian or Muslim of African religion, that is why we say it is difficult to separate African religion from African culture. And Finally, Dr. Nina, he said, is there any yes. From people's um, um, environment, they believe that there's somebody who superintends their life, and that person is given different names. In African religion, they call him different names. In Christianity, they call him by different names. In Islam, they call him by different names. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, can Thank Dr. Kaasarumi respond? Thank you. Can you hear yes. me, please? <laughs> yes, can we can hear, hear you. Yeah, I want to thank uh, my distinguished professors for their contributions. And I am going to start taking on uh, uh, Professor Sugolo's uh, question that uh, it's a righteousness separately from faith. You know, why I came up with what I came up is because of the fact that in the Quran, each time God talks about faith, he always connects it with the righteousness. So always in the traditions of Prophet Muhammad in the Quranic verses, when they talk about faith, and in this case in Islam, they yeah. always connect it with the righteousness. But in spite of that, that does not say that righteousness cannot stand on its own. It is separable from faith. The, the fact that righteousness is proceeding from one who does not even believe in the existence of God does not mean that such righteousness should be rejected from him or her. And the uh, intention matters in whatever we do. Intention. Any righteousness that proceeds from one whose intention is bad, such one will not have reward for that righteousness. So this is how I want to answer that question. Now, coming back to Professor Abdallah Ubadamu, our former VC. I think the first question was uh, the role of uh, faith in uh, migration. The typical example of this in Islam was uh, Umar ibn Khattab, the second Khalifa. Umar ibn Khattab was a staunch. Am I being hard? Well, am I being? Yes. Am I being? Yes. Okay. Yes. Umar ibn mm. Khattab was the second caliph <clears throat> after Prophet Muhammad. Abu Bakr assumed the position of caliphate, then Umar. Umar ibn Khattab was not a Muslim. And in fact, he was always looking for Prophet Muhammad and his followers to kill them. But at a point, Prophet Muhammad began to, to pray God that, oh God, increase uh, the population of Islam, honor Islam with conversion of uh, okay. 
Uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's Professor oh. Shishima. Yeah. Prophet Muhammad began to pray that Allah should honor Continue, Islam. Continue, Doc. Continue. Okay. Prophet Muhammad now began to pray that Allah should honor Islam with the conversion of uh, Umar ibn Khattab. And at a point, Umar was convinced. It was not as if uh, anybody went to him to pray to preach Islam to him. He went somewhere, and the, some parts of the Quran were being recited on that day, and he took up the Quran, and he read some version of the Quran, and he was able to get personal conviction, you know, about the truth of Islam. So he believed in Islam, and he migrated from being a non-believer to becoming a Muslim. That is one. And then about migration of Jesus Christ. That question mark that I put in front after Palestine, I say paradise and then question mark, question mark. Jesus Christ did not migrate out of uh, Palestine. But what I meant there was that uh, uh, Jesus Christ, after his migration from the surface of the heart, you know, where has he gone? Is it in the heaven, the ultimate destination or a, a position in between the heaven and, and the heart. Because we read in Islamic literature that for any soul that dies, the soul does not immediately go to hellfire or immediately go to paradise, but such soul is going to be in between the surface of the heart. And, and that place is where they call barzakh, barzakh. That is an intermediary position between the two. So Jesus Christ did not migrate out of Palestine. And then the question about when does the uh, proselytization stops? It does not have to stop at any point, but those who, who come from outside, who migrated or from another region onto a particular region, for example, Muslim conquerors, Muslim migrants, when they get there and they are able to do evangelization, when they observe that uh, the religion has become firmly established in the land, and then they can reduce their efforts, hoping that uh, those who have accepted the faith will continue what they were doing. Because it is not for anyone to compel any other person to accept uh, any faith. We have it in the Quran that uh, even if your Lord wills, he will have made every, each and every soul on heart to be Muslim or each and every soul on heart okay. to be followers of a particular religion. That's uh, answering the question of our former vice chancellor. On the, okay. That, we, okay, if you have more questions, doctor, if you yeah, have more have, questions to, be, to answer. Yeah, about uh, the question asked by Dr. Oyebode. Yes. He asked for the role of a mag uh, religious migration on secretism. Religion has come to correct, you know, this uh, tradition, uh, ignorant practices that people after accepting Islam or after accepting other faith, their ignorant practices are still being mixed with the practices of Islam. So those who migrate, the Muslims that migrate from one place to a particular place where Islam has not been firmly established, they are here, they are there to correct syncretism. It is now left for those people who accept the new faith to either accept, to refine their, 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 their faith, the new faith that they have accepted, or to continue mixing it with their ignorant traditional practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, thank you, Samuel, for holding forth for such a long time. I don't know, I can still see one hand up here, blessing or cinema. Is it that you have asked a question or your hand is just up? If you have not asked a question, can you quickly ask? Or comments oh, so that we can. Asked. Asked okay, so, so put down your hand, please. 
Well, yes. I don't know how to yeah. appreciate this uh, gathering. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, despite my... Just, excuse just me, ma'am. Yes. yes, excuse me, ma'am. We still have the uh, Reverend Father to respond before you close, ma'am. So answer questions. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Please go yes. ahead. I just want to apologize. I, I appear back now and I pray I'm back to the end now. Thank you so much. Please, uh, the Reverend Father should kindly respond yeah. so that we bring this uh, close. I know you yeah, people have been here for a long time. And uh... yeah, um, I think uh, first of all, I have to appreciate all the questions raised. For me, they are a way of enriching the paper. But few points I just want to make because of want of time, we don't go so much in detail, is that when we talk about missionary religion, um, it's in my slides, unfortunately, I could not run through all of them. The missionary religion is just any religion for is to proclaim its faith that moves from one location to the other. And by implication, and I made it very clear that Christianity, by its very nature, is a migrant religion, a missionary religion. Then, um, and we know that the first time Christianity left Palestine, it was out of persecution. And that's aided Christianity so much. I mean, uh, going around the way. And when we go back to the missionary mandate, it said, go into the world, Proclaim the good news to the people. And by going into the world means that this religion is condemned to migrate. And that is the point. Then the other point, could there be a point when proclamation will stop? We say no. Because we have it in Christianity that you even have the duty to re-evangelize the evangelized. So there is no point you will say that you have fully accepted that faith. It's always in the process of evangelization. So we talk also about the missionaries. Um, what the missionaries, that is an area where religion influences migration. Because um, any migration that is being prompted for religious purpose, it means that religion is also increasing the rate of migration. Like I said, every other comment, um, I've taken note of them. I have to do more on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Father. We appreciate your contribution. I don't know, is there any other area of uh, clarification or something before I make a few comments? Any other? Comments or questions? Well, in the absence of any, hello, um, is somebody on? Yes, ma. Yes, please. Who yes, is this? I'm kind of Yes, let's oh, hear. Oh, uh, our former VC. No. The former VC son is on. Director. Okay, for my VC's hand. Okay. Yeah. Yes, okay, okay, sir. Can I, uh, uh, Professor Ubada, please? Sorry, I didn't. You can, can you, you can kindly me. make your comments you and then. Uh, yeah, you can me, Abdel. No need for all these professors. <laughs> yes, I just want to add on the comment made by the last speaker who uh, on traditional, uh, no, on Christianity, why he said that uh, evangelism. Missionary evangelism, he suggested that missionary evangelism led to the spread of the religion. I'm under the impression that miss, missionary evangelism is a one way process. Missionaries come to a particular place, establish station, and then start combating people. Do they move on from that to another station? And it's, it's a continuous process. The reason why I ask this is because in Islam, in the history of Islam in Africa shows clearly that from Mali, migrants left Mali until they came to Kano. So wherever they, they, they go, they stop, evangelize, and then they move on after about 30, 40 years. But when they came to Kano, they make it their final destination. They don't move again. They don't go anywhere. So I'm interested. <laughs> they, they, Christianity seems to have indicated that once you come 
and you establish a station and you have your convert, that's it. You don't move on from, from, from there on. So I want him to clarify that issue because I don't think I either had him right or I agree. Thank you. Okay, uh, Prof, the, the you, point Jen. is that in Christianity, there is no point you will say you have ceased to evangelize. Oh, I have it. When, when you have evangelized, the evangelized has the duty to evangelize others. And the evangelize, like what is happening between Europe and Africa now, most of the Christian now go back to Europe to re-evangelize the evangelized. That's Africans who have been evangelized, move back to Europe to re-evangelize the European who earlier evangelized them. So it is a process of a movement. It's just like when you talk of retreat, when you talk of, you see that every time you go on retreat, so there is the, the end of evangelization is the end that we see God. I agree. I, I accept it now because that point was not clear, either in your main presentation or your explanation. So you are saying is that once you evangelize, each one evangelize the other. Order. And it continues that way. It's a continuous process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Amnen. Yes, ma. Yeah, yes, ma'am. My uh, mine is still a follow up on the question I asked earlier. I am not clear. Now, the, the 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 person that responded to my question actually gave me the names of God, which was not my worry. My worry is: is there anything physically that can show or that you can point at that says that there is a being? that subordinates the affairs of man and not his name. I know his name in different um, uh, religion and other, but uh, man, is, is there, is there an, an, did anybody can answer? I just want to know, is yes. there anything? But please, I shouldn't be judged as maybe no, not no, believing. No. I am a believer, but what is it that physically shows that there is a being that sees to the affairs of man? Um, I think I can just answer, uh, you are the concrete, person that shows that there is a being that answers to man because that you are there in our own Christian belief, you are the image of God. You are the image of God. God created you in his own image. So once you are alive, you are a, that concrete witness to God. Are you okay? Can I can I just make a point, please? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just for Nina, I just want to draw her attention to one thing in, in philosophy. One of the arguments for the existence of God is simply runs like this: that you have something that is big, and everything that is big has something that is bigger, and that bigger thing has something that is still bigger. But the point comes where you have something that other than which there can be nothing bigger. And that thing is God. Mm. That is okay. just, just the argument, see? There okay. must be a supreme being, the highest, okay. other than which you cannot think of anything higher. Okay. And that highest is God. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Are you satisfied now? <laughs> Satisfied? No, but I will, I will still be pleased if you want to add to it, sir. No, I, I will be coming from uh, the background of uh, Islam. You know, okay. we have it in the Quran and the tradition of Prophet Muhammad that uh, you human beings, when you remember or when you are being told that there's a supreme being somewhere, don't think about that being, that particular being. Don't think about his essence. How does he look? Does he hear the way? How do, does he have a leg? Because Prof was just telling us now that God created us in his own image. So don't okay. think that God's hand is like your own hand. Don't think that God's leg is like your own head. Don't think that God has, you know, a nose, an eye, then don't think about where is God, his position. So we are told in Islam 
that uh, to know God, we should think about the creations of God. And like Prof told you, you start from yourself and then you now proceed to, to thinking about other objects around you. You think about the sun, who brings the sun, you know, and takes it back in the night, the moon, the rivers. Sorry, what I, what I was talking about has nothing to do with the size of man. We're not to be big, the concept itself. It has nothing to do with, you know, person, we're not personalizing it. Yes, it sir. is non-physical. So it's a concept, the concept of big. All right, it has nothing to do with the concept of man or anything. Yes, you cannot begin to uh, put that concept into God. But mm -hmm. the very concept of big, the abstract concept of God itself, all right, it's an abstraction. Yeah. I, I don't want to sound uh, as if I'm not, uh, agnostic, I, I, I believe in God, but, but you, you are talking about the concept itself, the abstraction, the idea. So and I will just try to explain that if you are talking about why there must be God, it is mm -hmm. based on this kind of reasoning. And it is it's not to me making that this is a conventional thing in philosophy it started in the Greek old days, you know, the philosophers have started all that. So I'm just talking about what already is in the literature, not, not that it's my own uh, original idea. But that's not to do with the physical size of anybody, God and so forth. It's so not your idea. It's, it's the idea of dead Greeks. No, not the ideas don't belong to anything. <laughs> you see, that's the good thing I like about you. You say it's the idea of dead people. The ideas don't belong to anybody. The ideas belong to the whole world. Your idea is mine, and so forth. You always say philosophy belongs to all dead people. No, that is not true. You are a philosopher. You are living there. And when, and when you die, your ideas will still live on. I know that. Thank you very much. Sorry, we are delayed this. Uh, I think the... The moderator wants to close. Thank you. I'll finish, moderator. Hello. Okay. It's uh, Dr. Aneto. Okay. She's back. She's back. I want Hello, to say a big thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm here. I'm back. Uh, the thing is fluctuating every time, but um, yes, that's what I want to say. I think I want to really thank everybody. I. I can see that we've had a very good time here today because everybody just wants to drag this meeting on and on. And believe you me, it's just two minutes before two o'clock. And I think we've really dragged it on enough. We can start the uh, conversation on our WhatsApp group. We have the general WhatsApp group. We can ask questions and more clarifications. I really want to thank you all. And I want to say the only person I did not hear his speech at all, his uh, presentation at all is Professor uh, Shishima, and I'm really very sorry about that, but from the little I heard him respond, I think uh, everybody enjoyed your presentation. I thank you, and I say I'm once again very sorry for being out of this very interesting meeting. I think I have lost a lot because I didn't learn as much as others, but I thank you for being there for us, and I say we continue our discussion. Please, I want to beg you to kindly write up this, your beautiful presentations into a full blown paper. I mean, each person into a full blown paper so that we can present, we can have it peer reviewed in the International Journal for Migration Studies. Migration, as soon as we finish this uh, presentation so that we can get it peer reviewed. Thank you. And I say that by his grace, next week is another episode. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye all.